Welcome back, everyone, to TNO, the last days of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mexico Lover. But we are on our journey playing as Mexico. We have about four ish years of content, and we've only gone through the first three months. Clank. Clank. That was a sound a wrench made as she thrust it against the metal sheet to tighten the bolt with five quick turns. She had gotten it down from six quick turns, and in the six months she had arrived from the farm, she tried to think about how much better this was in the farm. Clank. But, uh, Coahila. Uh, a sweatshop was not a good place to think because those suts turned her aching arms with the grease that wouldn't wash out the clank. She made just enough paces to put tortillas on her table and sleep in a bed so she could hear this clank and put tortillas on her table and sleep in a bed in. Th there wasn't a clank. The line had stopped. Manuel, the Confederation of Mexican Workers' Representative, had walked over. Along with the others, she dutifully informed a semicircle around him. Manuel's voice began in a practice hush. Brothers and sisters, I come with exciting news for you. The short support for the revolution, the source of all of our rights as workers, the CTM has arranged transportation to Satillo for rally. So take up these banners, these symbols of equality and justice, and join us. Some of her male colleagues took the banners and headed to the bus outside. She, like most of the others, received a small PRI flag instead. It was only upon taking it that she realized the wrench was still in her other hand. The clank would resume tomorrow. Fisher of men. Enrique stepped out of his comfort zone and onto the pier. The boardwalk had been fruitless for the young pan campaigner, with too many tourists and worse, the eerie feeling that he was being watched. Nervous. He took in the mix of wood and rust that made up the city's fishing fleet. A group of fishermen stopped to look at him. You come for another fee? Spat one of the, over one of the surfers? No, said Enrique, a righteous anger rising in his throat. No, I didn't. The opposite, actually. I'm looking to make sure honest men like yourselves never get shaken down by some PRI flunky ever again. Eyes widened. He took them. How? I'm not going to tell you to join this or that sector union, controlled by the very people that rob you. There's a better way. Vote. Vote to put someone who listens to you in the city hall. Not a PRI man who has only goals to impress the governor. It says Bob in an agreement, all that was left to, was to reel them in. Take this pamphlet, Enrique said, soft hands deftly pressing blue and white sheets into callous palms. It has names and photos of Pans and Senada candidates. As the doc launched into a spirited conversation, Enrique tried to gauge his haul. Fifteen, maybe twenty votes, a few more days like this, and maybe Pan had a chance. From Pan and Fish, miracles, and El Circlon. Lopez Mateos felt a grumble heave from his chest. He looked longingly out to the cityscape and felt a drowsy spell come over him. His only reprieve was a cigar he had selected from his humidor. The whistle stopped tour had been busy but fruitful. He sped up and down the country, shaking hands in public and knuckling down the governors in private. His demands? No factionalism. No trouble, more taxes, more support. Most of them knew better, were receptive, acted agreeable, and so on, but that guy, Leopoldo Sanchez Celes, was particularly greasy. He had facilitated, vacillated, pretended not to know what he was talking about, and even gave him those stupid looks. Stupid. Odious. Do you not know who he was? He was a gosh darn president. Carlos A. Madrazo, governor of Tabasco, swung through the door. Forgive me, Your Excellency, is it a bad time? Lopez Mateos noted that he had been deeply frowning. He looked at his reflection through the double gazing and saw a cankerous fool stare back. It was not like him. No, 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 please. Licenciado, grab a seat. Madrazo blew into a seat and glared at the president's cigar, lazily clutched it between his fingers and frowned subtly. Are you satisfied with the tour? I did what I had to do. It's just not pleasant, is it? Lopez Mateo put it out. The issue of the succession. People use it as an opportunity for their own ends. You have my full support, Your Excellency. You know very well I've always have been in your camp, Madrazo nodded. If there's anything I can do to say the word. I know what those fools from the old guard are like. He was right after all. Madrazo had been a supporter since the 50s. A key ally in his bid for the presidency. Thank you, Governor. But, uh, yeah. So we're going to continue on. Uh, we got some comments to go through. And, yeah. And then we'll kind of go from there. Uh, agricultural stuff. We're all doing that stuff. Unproductive, very productive. So we want to be productive with the productive ones. Very rural, moderately rural, slightly urban, very urban here. Um, what am I getting more political power? So probably want to do the one that does give us more political power in the end too. Mm, I don't know if it's this, these ones like we saw yesterday or the other day. Uh, let's do this one. Uh, more influence. Where's the one for political power? Well, to me, we already did the one for political power. I don't remember. That's not a bad state. Industry, unemployment, population goes even further down. That's, that's nice. Maybe it was one of these. Population. Oh. Relief? No, I just looked at these. No, 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 no. And then we have got these ones too, so. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. Any projects? Nope. Good. Good. And keep an eye on all this stuff. So, a team sport. So, if you want to do this again, please go right ahead. Boop. Boop. And then hide the injuries. Power will increase. The Veracruz. Debut. What is that one next? The existence of the Mexican Revolution on the international stage has always been a complex reality. As the imperialist powers attempt to infiltrate and influence a great nation, the revolution has been forced to isolate itself to survive today. The situation has significantly improved as revolutionary zeal has spread across Latin America. 
Fidel Castro of the Republic of Cuba and Wolfgang Larzabal of the Republic of Venezuela have both become significant allies of the PRI. Their commitment to revolutionary struggle cannot be understated, and as such we must stay united in a fight against imperialism and despotism. President Lopez Mateo staunchly believes in the Latin American Revolution and shall invite Castro and Lara Zabel to Veracruz to discuss our collective future. The king in Aguascalientes and Enrique Olivares, Olivares Santana sampled some, of the, sampled some of the vintage Don Calzada has brought for him. He beamed a convincing smile, took his glass, and gave it a regal whiff. Senor, how is the business with the farmers? Don Calzada shifted in his rats and seat a bit, sipping conservatively from the fruits of his own labor. Oh, miraculously, the labor of his underpaid, ill-treated workers. Governor, they complain that I do not pay them enough. I've heard tales that they are planning to stage some sort of revolt. The land Don Calzada owned was officially Ejidal, but in fact it was a large-scale private farm that he controlled right from his compound, a consequence of the reforms of Miguel Aleman, whom Olivares had helped elect. He spent many nights with him campaigning for Aleman in the beautiful city of Aguascalientes, after all. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll make use of some of the local police and we can try to sort this thing out, however. They don't seem to deflate. Please, Governor, I do not have any money. Olvarez, Olvarez, drank from the Pignol Noir and put on his snide laugh, so you will not compensate them for their services? You're a smart man, don't give me that. Telephone my secretary in the morning and bring your checkbook. The feeble vineyard owner was an easy racket. He had inspired himself into such debt that Olivares could ask anything of him. And who could he complain to? The governor had built the roads, schools, and hospitals. He was a favorite son of Aguascalientes, and his word was law, at least until the president had said otherwise, as part of Lopez Mateos' tour. Governor Olivares had promised his undying loyalty, but more importantly, his own money. As long as he could provide for the president, he would screw around Don Calzada as much as he liked. A good year, senor. And eclipsed. The state of Michoacan, the soul of Mexico, was the birthplace of Lazardo, Lazaro Cardenas. And so the Cardenista PRI, the solo party, gathered there to discuss how to continue his legacy. To make themselves known to each other and known to the world as standard bearers of the revolution, that had been the plan anyways. Cardenas himself decided to show, shadow the conference with a massive rally, setting it on the same date and time. This caused some confusion within the conference room, though. Over the din of shouting leftists, Carlos Madrazo brought his fist down on the oaken table. Rather than silencing the crowd, the pounding encouraged others to bicker louder. The only word that managed to pierce the escalating cacophony of shadow a... Tamaulipas. Madrazo himself drew up, summoning the authority he had learned to muster in the rough and tumble thirties. Is this what General Cardenas would want? He boomed, but the chaos surrounding him did not subside. A finger jabbed uh, Madrazo's chest as a party member to his left began a uh, uh, mostly inaudible rant about the CTM. Fed up, the southern cyclone brushed past the elderly revolutionaries he stormed out, passing the threshold of co the conference room. Madrazo muttered to himself, Is this what the General Cardenas would want? A giant cast a long shadow over a field of dwarves. I'll put some, uh, some uh, comments from the last video to include. Pick the Madrazo path. Someone says, poor Mexico, so far from God and so close to the United States, says this guy from Porfirio Diaz. Another person says, haven't played Tiano in a while. Must, be, must explain the update. That's it's looking not bad. Um, so it says, loves all my videos. Someone says, we well, would love a Libsock Zukov. And someone else says, we should do Madrazo at first. So we'll see. Yeah, public housing. I want to be bad. I just want too much debt because we're going to be slapping on tons of debt here. And we might do different... Maybe, I don't know if we'll do different campaigns because there's a little bit of different campaigns here and there, but not so much. Really, you get the different people you can elect after uh, uh, Mateos is gone. Lopez Mateos. Good. I just want to keep that an eye on that. It's looking better. I'll check him. The president of Mexico opened the door to an office, an office where both the president and its owners were in attendance. Decisions which affected millions were to be made. Knocking on the door was a mere formality. The man inside knew he was coming and listened to what Lopez Mateos had to say. Licenciado Velazquez, Velazquez, I see you've been busy. The president looked at the stack of papers on his desk, belonging to the leader of the country's largest labor union, the Confederation of Mexican Workers. No doubt pertaining to preparations for the succession, the president commented no further. Fidel Velazquez looked up from his paper. Never too busy to host your excellency, of course. What news do you bring me? I thought I'd keep you updated on my thought process surrounding my successor. As of late, Ordaz's actions have kept me in doubt, let's say. Ordaz, really? Interesting. I thought the opposition locked down. A look of concern flip flashes over the man's eyes, while Mateos continues, one would think. Mateos knew that Ordaz was Velasquez's preferred man for the job and refrained from letting the issue linger anyways. I was also going to ask about the infrastructure projects. It is imperative they remain steady, for you never know when we might have to use them for something. Lopez Mateos smiles, Olympic in scale. The two traded looks, and Velasquez took the hint. Of course, Your Excellency, they will. Simple procedure. That was a place for the names. Fernando Gutierrez Barrios had countlessly sequestered in the recesses of his mind. Soon a name would be all that remains of Manuel Sebastian Ortiz. 
Al Gutierrez's, Gutierrez's order. A, a DFS agent had been assigned to the case, noted from the communist agitator in his district. You know what to do from there. A quick arrest for something minor. An incident that left the dissident's face disfigured and heart stopped. A body dismembered and dumped. A transfer of records from hospitals, offices, and schools to a small fire. An entry with the agitator's own key into his own apartment, removing any personal effects and documents in a black brief briefcase. A vague missing person description and a bland DFS report on the disappearance of a local nuisance. Only good years would remember the name Manuel Sebastian Ortiz. And someone else says we should keep some political power. But the pre Olympic torch. Oh. 8 o'clock, and gentlemen, that is why we must begin mobilizing all our resources. That being said, keep all reasons why on the hush. Velasquez meant it, and the CTM board understood. Our bid is not confirmed. Yes, licenciado. Discrepancy, we understand. The CNC will host a meeting discussing the plan shortly, and all regions will be informed. They had hung up the phone quickly, calling in her boss to give him the news. In the boardroom of a PRI office in Guerrero, a voice booms. We have orders from on high to accelerate all projects in the worker sector immediately. The regional CTM bosses look on silently to get to it. 1300. An El Capulco. A union boss meets with his subordinates in a small office downtown. Something big is coming, we're a part of it. We need all the dock workers on overtime shifts. The bosses look on concerned. Orders are orders, and these come all the way from the CDMX. 1500. Here's what we need you guys to do. The union rep dodged a shipping container, barely keeping his head as he spoke to the supervisor. Ooh, so we need pontoons. 1800 hours. Martin's side, his day was almost over. Walking to the port entrance to clock out, his supervisor bumped him into him with a box, handing it to him. What? Did you hear? We have overtime this week. Ooh. Stimulation, 51%. Productivity, population, very urban. Uh -huh. It's poverty like, it's coming down just a little bit. That's for the country, it looks like. <coughs> urban quality of life will go up. Quality of life. Rural, that won't really matter for us. Here. Rural simulation. Unemployment. Unpo unemployed population will get better. Base stimulation will get better. Resource extraction. I don't mind state industry because it does help out with unemployed populations. Sponsor industry. Minus three, ten percent more stimulation or better unemployed populations. It's cost less political power, so I want to do this one maybe. A helping hand from his perch atop the bulldozer. The destitution of the Choto Maya village was plain to Carlos Madrazo. He took in the bare feet and cramped regular rectangular houses. The threadbare clothes and solemn faces, centuries of alternating neglect and hostility from the capital here in Tabasco, had reduced these people to backwardness and misery, but that ended today. The governor drew the megaphone to his lips. Our state is firmly committed to social progress, especially to uplift our most needy citizens. <clears throat> it is my promise to you that no tool will go unused. The man will be emptying our quest to bring you the fruits of a modern and prosperous way of life. Today will carry you on the first step of that long journey. Today will provide you with the fertile fields to feed your future. Madrazo directed the bulldozer forward, toppling the first tree of the wretched jungle that hemmed in the village. Even over the engine's roar, he heard the applause and cheers of the construction workers. What Madrazo did not hear, what he could not understand, were the whispers and yokot an by the watching villagers. Whispers that asked what they would do without the jungle that provided the palm wood for the houses and crafts. Whispers that asked where they would hunt as the village men had for generations. Whispers that asked what would be stolen for the next. They would never leave us in peace. Need to put it apart. Should have been that one, but whatever. Continuity. Lanisilla and Chiapas knew the patterns of time. It knew of heat and rain. It knew of hose and sweat. It knew of Gustavo's life and rhythm, just as it knew of those men and women who told the Egito alongside him. It knew that they would die, that he would die, just as Gustavo's father and grandfather had before him. That they would die, they would live in the same, same simple houses, eat the same simple meals made from the corn and beans they wretched from it. But every so often there would be a disturbance. A man in a white shirt and red bone would struggle to coax his horse up the rocky path to the village. A few others came to the village, and they each came in their own ordained time. The petty traders came after the harvest, Mario, when someone had a fever. This one, though, this one from the Confederación Nacional Campesina, seemed to come and go as he pleased, but this disturbance had his own patterns. Gustavo would greet the man sullenly, and they would talk for a few minutes. Gustavo would leave the man as family would scrounge together the pesos he had demanded. The peasants would then follow the man and his horse down the rocky trail, for the hours it took to reach the main road. They would be taken to a rally where they would be told about the revolution and the bright future the PRI was bringing them. They would shamble at home around daybreak, and things would continue as before. Nothing new under the sun. Veracruz rendezvous. 
Lopez Mateos embraced Lazarabal. Lara, uh, Lara Zabal, who struck up a golden smile on Castro dressed in his trademark green fatigues for the press corps' flashing cameras. Lara Zabal was certainly jovial, captured laughing and trading w witticisms from both the journals and Castro in particular. The mood in the meeting was equally jovial, although it started to drag a little in Lopez Mateos' mind. Lara Zabal was a brilliant talker, yes, but to the point where he could say a lot without actually saying anything tangible. I'm a big supporter of this sort of cooperation I am. I think it's a good thing. I'm all for it. What am I concerned about is what it means. What does it mean? Lara Zabal created a glass of brandy. Castro shot a pointed look at Lopez Mateo, who spoke up. A power block that will keep imperialism out of South America. An anti-colonial vanguard. We can't afford another Trujillo, can we? Lara Zabal's cheery demeanor hardened his brow, straining. You needn't remind me, Excellency, but I'm interested in specifics. Castro perked up in his seat, pouring out brandy for himself and more for Lara Zabal. What my friend His Excellency is trying to say, El Presidente, is they'll take the form of an official, say, movement of forms, a uh, forum, or a movement of nations forum. Lopez Mateos plucked the carafe for his own pleasure. All we need is your assistance, glancing at Lara Zabal, who seemed to shift in his seat. His thoughts were obscured beneath the facade of a genial, easygoing smile. Pensive silence. Then, gentlemen, you have Venezuela. The Christian the Veracruz Forum with a toast. Oh, good. How are the injuries? Mexico has made great strides under Lopez Mateos, yet wounds remain. The state government of the Guerreros failed to contain large-scale and escalating student demonstrations last year and was accordingly dissolved under federal authority. The military has put down the protest, but the situation remains fragile. We'll contain the situation and uphold a reputation by making sure not a word about Guerrero appears in print, on radio or on TV, until stability returns and the bloodstains fade. Based on the day's arrival, a fresh batch of agents from the Directorate of Federal Security, or DFS, will track down and arrest a few dissidents who still evade our reach. Good. No. Yeah. Accelerates urban migration. Costs a lot of money to do this. <clears throat> well, we do what we can. And the Olympic dream. Oh, Lopez Mateos had served the world, saved the world, but that is not enough for him. His dream is not only to, for his name to be recognized, it's that one day everyone will be able to point to Mexico on a map. He understands that his dream is not something that he alone can do and recognizes that his work will not even end in his presidential term. Mexico must be in everyone's mind by the end of the decade, and for that he'll need to start something bigger than himself. Something bigger even than even Mexico. <clears throat> to truly captivate the world, he needs something with a story, tradition, and millions of people eager to see. He needs the Olympics. He might not be the president when the Olympics of 1968 happens, but he will lay the groundwork for a successor to capture the world's attention and prove that Mexico is more than just a neighbor of the U.S. Now, how do we convince the committee? We'll need to make a decision. More growth, more growth, more growth. 0.95, 6 The last manifesto of Ruben Yaramillo. To many Mexico's rural peasantry and poor, Ruben Yaramillo is a living symbol of liberation, of freedom from the shackles of the ranchers' own landlords and resistance to the despotism of the PRI. The last of the original Zapatistas, Zapatistas, joining the ranks of the revolution at age 14, he has constantly fought for land reform in his home state of his whole life, struggling to obtain the rights promised in the 1917 Constitution. But to those in the PRI and Mexican government, he is a constant thorn in the side of the presidency, carrying out multiple revolts in the home state of Morelos over the last few decades with a radicalized belligerent band of loyalists known as Yaramilistas. Despite receiving amnesty and concessions multiple times, he remains steadfast in the face of injustices against the working class, some of them has pointed, painted a target on his back for an increasingly frustrated Lopez Mateos and the DFS. Despite this, the old revolutionary has reemerged once more for International Workers' Day, presenting the last manifesto for all to see, darn the consequences. In it, he denounces the government's efforts to suppress him, and it details the coming years as a pivotal moment in the struggle for the working class of Mexico against the corrupt, ineffective PRI government. A government, he states, that has failed to fulfill the original promise of the Mexican Revolution. A rallying cry for the rural and working class alike. It is spreading like wildfire in newspapers and working class circles all throughout Mexico. Meanwhile, behind closed doors, the army and DFS have decided that enough is enough, and with an operation to kidnap and execute Yarmilo already in the works, a plan which would be had the Yarmilista movement before they could throw Mexico ever again. The final cry of the old revolutionaries. My fatherland comes first. Augustin Olachea Alvarez hunched over his desk, making his way through a mountain of forms and reports. He remained in Guerrero after the dissolution of the state government last year. Officially, he was there to support the interim governor appointed by the president. In practice, the day-to-day -day business of administration ran through Olachea's office and the state government building in Chilpancingo. A knock on the door offered a moment's respite from the interminable interminable legalese. Come in, he said gruffly. A bald and colonel stepped into his office, holding a manila envelope under his arm. He gave a crisp salute. General Olachea, sir? At ease, what do you have for me? He said flatly. Apart from the 27th base outside Alcapulco, the additional battalion robbed of that incident, the full report is unfolded. 
I'll let you in now to thank you, Colonel. I'll flip through the articles you brought for me from the Di Diario de Guerrero. Make sure they can't buy any more papers until they've been brought in. Line, you're dismissed. Once the Colonel left, Ola Chea opened the folder and leafed through the report. The garrison was in dire state. The equipment was outdated as anywhere else in the country. Spare parts to repair broken vehicles and weapons were scarce. Shipments of food saw frequent delays. The men would not starve, but they would always be hungry. It was hard to keep his mind from Alcapulco, just 10 kilometers from the base. The jet set seat of the OFN and the sphere slept in American hotels and drank and dined in Japanese restaurants. Just as soon as the money came in, I was flying back out to the countries I had arrived from, 50 years after the revolution, and Mexico still an ulcer the blood wolf. Spineless officials at every level of government shook hands with foreign kleptocrats while the people of Mexico sweltered in the fields and the factories. All that GS sighed, poured himself a drink, and got back to work. Like said, and the revolution devours its children. Purgatory. May 3rd, 1962. Actors term as deputy and the More Morelos State Congress had ended. That guy, Lopez Avilar, would never renew his term. Hector was a keen supporter of the Avilar's rival, Raymond Delgado Gil, as nominee for governor in 1958. Avilar ended up prevailing in the end, and over the last few years, he routinely hamstrung Hector and Ramon, keeping them in the dark at every opportunity. Hector's term lapsed only as confirmed what had already been the case. He was irrelevant. A thought of the guy, Lopez Avilar, one of the gang of traitors who murdered Emiliano Zapata back in 1919, becoming the governor of the most revolutionary state in the nation, made his stomach churn in disgust. His sand seemed to strangle the steering wheel as he drove along sleepy country roads. The man had no supporters among the common people, the salt of the earth. The only reason he was in power was because he had friends in high places. All the while, Hector would have to put up with a mid-level position within the Morelos CNC. He made his blood boil. The party machine was working against him, clearly against good men, him and Raymond, letting stupid vultures like Avalon roam around the place. Where was the justice in the world? As the car caught and splitter over the hill, the side of the town sparkled in the dust. The power line, standing colossal and walking parallel down the hill with his mighty cables, powered the lights and electricity in every hometown. Or town home. And it was he, Hector Campuzano Rojas, who had erected it. Avalar could lock him out of the halls of power, but it would still be his party. He'd come this far and done uh, Jujuta pr proud as his favorite son. He just needed to hold out until 1964. In succession. The paper was full of tasks only Ordaz could do. Handwritten by Lopez Mateos, like so many of his predecessors. It was the president's hand guided, glided down to sign, it slowed, it wavered, it halted. Could Ordaz really do it? He certainly could handle security threats or corral party members. Gustavo was an unrivaled secretary of the interior, but could he be president of Mexico that Mexico needed? Lopez sighed. It was 1959. 1958. You were chosen Ordaz to succeed him in a heartbeat. In 59 too. Every month of the year, until that darn standoff in the northern Pacific. Had Ordaz always been so foolish, so bullheaded, and hawked to the U.S.? Or something broke in his old ally's mind. Whatever the case, Gustavo's previously impeccable record was blotted. The president swore, so was his previously impeccable note. The pen had leaked all over the bottom half. As he tried to recreate his work on a fresh sheet, he thought about alternatives. That was some decent figure on the party's left, and neither Lopez Mateos, but no. The left was in shambles and could not organize itself, let alone Mexico. Ortiz Minya and his technocrats they had done a heck of a job with his economy. This growth that made Lopez Mateos' ambitions for education and welfare possible. Could it be pushed further by their bold policies? Well, there were men with numbers in their veins and cold hands. Lopez Mateo saw his hands had left the new page smudged and streaked with spilled ink as well. It had been also clear as before. With Odaz's influence weakened, the battle for succession ca category has been unlocked. Ooh. El Tabado. Ooh, interesting. Um, under the PRI, Mexico is a perfected democracy. Many parties compete in elections, but only one hours wins. Accordingly, however, whoever is chosen by the PRI to serve its candidate in the upcoming federal elections will serve as the nation's next president. <coughs> The party's nomination process has also been perfected. Following potentially fatal schisms and contested elections in the 40s and 50s, genuine intra-party discourse has been smothered and replaced with strict presidential control. The president selects a successor with a single mighty finger and the so-called El Dedazo, De and the party leaps to support its decision. But who is the lucky one of the apex of the president's disgraces? And to whose hands will place Mexico's fate? From the halls of power to the late dining rooms nationwide, all speculate as to the identity of this mystery man, this El Tapado. Every wag in Mexico City offers a whispered opinion, every advisor jostles for attention to rank. A select few even seek to befriend the president himself to carry favor, but only one is next in line. O one, only one is El Tapado. Oh. Currently the president's opinion of Ordaz is below. Of Salinas is average. Currently the president's opinion left us is and national is extremely negative. Is this it? Oh. Gustavo Diaz Ordaz is my Secretary of Interior, my companion from earlier in my political career, my strong right-hand man, and the one who held my administration and my country together for six long years, my friend. Special relationship weakened, decreases his opinion. <clears throat> Ordaz's position, increases his opinion. 
The American Connection. Here's his opinion. A lot of friends up north. And Raul Salinas Lozano, Secretary of the Industry and Commerce Salinas Lozano is one of my economic ministers. A capable and ambitious northerner, he clearly seeks to demonstrate his mental and gain my favor. A relative newcomer to the PRI, I will still consider him as a potential option, if only to keep Ordaz on his toes. The cold technocrat maintains opinion. Okay. We have our man in Japan. Here's his opinion. And then the left still believes the revolution's road culminates in socialism. They have the right intentions and occasional good ideas, but their unwillingness to accept governance necessary compromises has caused me endless heartaches. At least they stand now with the PRI for now. Cardenius is shreds. So that's not good. If the leftists and nationalists reach an opinion of one or more, a new container for succession may appear. Ooh. Cardenius' influence also increases his opinion. And who here? Ah, so this is every, all these guys in the... Extremely negative. It is negative 8. Holy crap. It's 2 and it's negative 1. Oh, that's interesting. El Tapado. Interesting. John Gordon reigns supreme. Well, okay. So out the presses. Mateo said in the nearly deserted office in the Diario del Guerrero, the imprintable article, a scathing expose in the military occupation of Guerrero following the dissolution of the state government, sat in front of him on the desk, as had the day before and the day before that. It just wasn't that the article was in violation of the news press regulations in the state, no. What really made the article unprintable was a lack of paper. Last week, after a series of inflammatory pieces on the new regime in the state, the PRI stopped approving sales of paper to the printing house. Most of the workers had been sent home then. Then there were still journals drafting articles and editors like Matteo to review them, but otherwise they were running a skeleton crew. The boss wasn't sure when they'd be back in operation until then they had costs. Somewhere outside his office, a phone rang. Matteo stepped onto the silent space and made his way between the rows of empty desks and turned to Selm. He had been pulling double duty as a boss secretary the past few days, not that there wasn't many phone calls to take anymore. He lifted the handset to his mouth and spoke. This is the Dario del Guerrero. How can I help you? Hello, the voice coming from the receiver was smooth, deep, and confident. This is Felipe Delgado. I'm a lawyer representing the state of Guerrero. Mateos' heart sank. We believe the articles printed in your paper concerning the actions of the state government are malicious falsehoods. If your paper continues to act as a threat to public order in Guerrero, we'll have no choice but to pursue legal action for the crimes of libel and social dissolution. God, what was he going to tell his boss? The text of the unprintable article fit lash through his mind. The stories of the beatings in dark alleyways. Interviews of people who had survived the massacres in the streets. However, the boys continued, the state of Guerrero would like me to pass on a generous offer. They'll send a legal team to review every article before it goes to print. They help you and help your team to draft a more truthful portrayal of events. What do you say? Uh, I'll have to take it up with my boss, Mateo replied. They both knew there was no choice but to agree. Picking up the torch. The boardroom began clearing as yet another meeting concluded. Lopez Mateo settled a deep sigh in his stretch before finally standing up to leave. His body still not acclimated to the time zone and being forced to remain sedentary all day was starting to take its toll. Leaving the room, he took this as an opportunity to stretch out his legs during this interlude. Strolling around the conference building where these meetings were taking place, he encountered his Secretary of External Relations doing the same. The President beckoned Barral to join him in an empty room so they could catch up on developments. Barral released a groan as they both sat down. Couldn't we have just waited a few days before the, before to begin these decisions or discussions? I'm still completely jet-lagged, and it's a miracle that I haven't dozed off in the middle of one of these meetings. But by judging by what's been said so far, it's not like I would be missing out on much. Barral chortled to himself. Lopez Mateos joined him with a quick laugh. It's not ideal, but we'll just have to make do. You know why we're doing all these god-awful meetings. It's because I have my eyes on the prize. Hosting the Olympics in Mexico, bringing the world's athletes to why we're killing ourselves buttering up all these foreign representatives. We can't prepare a bid all on our own. We need foreign support. A grin slowly emerged in Barad's face. A gush of energy filled both men as they thought of a successful bit entering their minds. The fatigue they had been enduring melted away as they focused on the task at hand. A flame ignites. Oh, I have nothing else here. So, we got the political power from that. Um, I want to use it, but I'm not sure if we should or not yet. Rural versus urban. What are we looking at right now? Uh, the Gulf. So, Yucatan. Southeast. I really want to increase Veracruz. You know, the Gulf. You know, which is around here where Veracruz is at. Uh, uh, let's see. Because... Because they are very productive farms. Incredibly productive farms. I want to do both of these. I still like the liquid reserves. It gives us a little more stimulation. Um, let's see. The stimulation right here is 54.4%. It's at the base where it should be. Um, just because I do want more uh, poverty to improve as well. So we're going to do both of these again. And it's still going to be a 50-50, which is nice. But then, this gets uh, this get that much better. But it got a little better. Uh, ooh, the Book of Numbers. The campaigners crowd around Enrique as they smoothed out another crinkled sheet, converting its plethora of tally marks into firm numbers. The light from the setting sun was too dim for them to review the results of the combined polls, though many continued to try, those like Sebastian. Who looked instead at Enrique's face found only a rigid mask of concentration. After it felt like an eternity, the young man set his pencil down and faced his audience. 
36% Enrique says a triumphant grin spread across his features. The room erupted. Was he sure? Yes, he triple checked. Yes, had he? Yes. He had accounted for the different sides of each poll and the varying populations of the neighborhoods and towns. As he dispensed with their objections one by one, a stunned silence descended on the rooms. And then with a shout, several whoops and cheers as Enrique clambered onto his chair, thrusting the results into the air. We did this, he cried, our sweat, our words are on every page here. Through the applause and whistles that followed, Sebastian roared, I got something to say. Eyes turned from the teetering youth to the elderly veteran. I was here in 46 and we got 1%. Then we got 8% in 52. Every miserable election since, and that's the first number that doesn't sound like crap. Tecates are on me. 36 for each of us. Pan was in the race, not to win a majority in the state government, but no, but to be a voice for clean, accountable democratic politics in Baja, one incapable of being ignored. Go forth and multiply. Boots on the ground, Carlos marched down the narrow streets of Chilpancingo with a small crowd of fellow protesters. This was the latest in a long string of demonstrations in the city of ACG, the Guerrero Civic Association. He had been with the group for at least two years, taking a stand against a police regime that settled over the region since the state government had been dissolved for the first time in the mid-50s, now nearly a decade on and things only seemed to have gotten worse. The government was dismissed for a second time and soldiers man checkpoints points at every street corner, not that it had done much to dissuade the group from organizing. Even after the marches last December, it was a simple matter to get people into the streets. It seemed like everyone knew someone who was harassed or beaten by soldiers for the crime of going about their day, and so they marched and they waved signs and they yelled, all the while packs of soldiers brandishing rifles and watched them pass by. Occasionally, other men would join them and watch them pass. Uh, uh, men with plain clothes and hateful eyes who talked handguns into the waistbands and cursed and spat on the demonstrators, anything to give them a reason to start shouting. Carlos had just passed by a group of agitators when one of them picked up a rock off the street and threw it into the crowd. It had Carlos on his brow. So next to him, sort of the, toward the man who had thrown him. In an instant, it was December again and everything was noise. The cracks of a rifle fired on the smoke and screams of Indianus and blood on his face and all down his shirt. Carlos reached out and caught the arm of his fellow distant in a vice grip. Just leave him, no arguments were made. The price of retaliation was clear. They'd not be killed today. They could only be hoped it would not happen tomorrow. This is basically nothing but, you know, it'd help out a little bit. Uh, to our Olympic proportions. To put it bluntly, we cannot secure the 1968 Summer Olympics as things stand now. Explained Secretary Broad, we need more support, ideally from a country that can bring it, uh, others to our side. In other words, a superpower. Lopez Mateos added, but how can we win them over and which power should we approach? Salinas wore a broad, confident smile. Your Excellency, I believe Japan's the ideal partner for this. You proved your sincerity to Tokyo during the Aleutian Crisis. As they support us like the rest of the sphere will follow suit. I could arrange a good world tour across Asia, culminating in a meeting with Prime Minister Eno himself. Mateos nodded, delighted by the idea of traveling abroad. Your Excellency, or Dao's interjected, with all due respect to the Secretary Salinas, I believe we should be approaching the U.S. The President glared daggers at him, but Ordao pushed on. As he says, Japan was satisfied by our handling of the crisis. It's the Americans that feel slighted. We cannot afford to set them further. A tour of North America will help repair our relationship. For a split second, he hesitated, and I assure you, they can be reasonable. At a point, Mateo stopped tempering his anger, for as much as Nixon's antics during the crisis had stung, basic geography dictated that Mexico must not alienate the United States completely. Yet Mateo saw a proposal for what it truly was, a chance for Ordeas to redeem himself. A tour of the U.S. would make use of his connections of North, just as a tour of the sphere would require Salinas' network. Should he favor give his old favorite one last chance, or allow Salinas to prove his worth instead? Well, hmm. Here's level 5, then. Uh, and we have a cup of coffee here, too, which is why I made that sound. It's average. Hmm. Where do we help our original guy, Gustavo? Weakened. His position. The American connection. I don't know, because obviously we have the Yasuda crisis going to happen. But then... America doesn't mean it'll go do really well. I mean, you could have Wallace and do nothing. I have no idea. Hmm. Mena. Disorganized leadership for even more despotism. I don't know if we can get any of these guys. Focus on according to the U.S. But their opinion of us is available in the battle for succession decision category. Succession decision. Perfect dictatorship. Yeah. Complete focus across the Rio Grande, you opt to lock in the focus street, or for the sphere. Where can we see uh, again how much they like us? It wasn't here, the perfect dictatorship. Yeah, I just looked at all this stuff. Oh, it was here actually. So, actually, the Americans actually already like us. Even though I would prefer the Japanese to like us more because it gives us better annual GDP growth factor. So, 
I maybe we'll go with the Americans for now because we have a better they have a better opinion of us. But do we have to balance it out though? Hmm. If we do this one across the Rio Grande. Say that Mexico and the United States have a turbulent history, it would be an understatement. Right now, however, the States is Mexico's best hope for getting the votes required to host the Olympics. Such an event would bring unimaginable prestige to our country and put the eyes on the world upon us. President Mateos has planned a trip to the U.S. to open a dialogue with the aim of securing the votes we need, while Syria will also attempt to acquire other concessions from them, getting them to give us the Chamizal for instance would make a nice feather in our political cap. President's opinion of Odeas will increase by one. Bureaucrat loyalty will increase, which I do like, I think. Pro focus on approaching the U.S. Compromise on trade duties. Less power and loyalty. American business and opinion will go up. Promote sister cities. That's not bad. A quick whim. Reform the Bracero program. The kind of become more decentralized. Or just get more base stimulation, which I like, which is nice. Atmospheric friendship. Cost money, though. Improve relations with vital neighbors. Keep the oil flowing. Worker power and loyalty will increase, which is good. Uh, cross border trade. Become more decentralized. I like more base stimulation. Northeast is not bad. Pan American Highway. Less worker loyalty, more bureaucrat loyalty. And more American influence. So right now, um, this is the party bureaucracy. Oh, look at that. So they have 90 loyalty, 85 power, and no corrupt, and 40 cor corrosion. So I'm surprised to see that we're supposed to be getting some sort of benefit from them. Power benefit. They're very powerful, but they're very loyal too. So I want to get the, this one first. More base stimulation. It's only 1%, but promote sister cities. Since the end of the war, the idea of sister cities, the partnering of two geographically and culturally separate communities, has proliferated throughout the free world. The pairing up of these communities has led to a deeper trust, understanding, and commercial benefit between peoples who would otherwise have no reason to speak to each other. The sister cities concept hasn't taken root in Mexico, and it's time for that to change. By pursuing partnerships between Mexican and American communities, be they rural or urban, we can foster mutual understanding and create opportunities for cooperation that have not been possible in the past. And then we're forming the Bracero Program at the time of its signing. The Bracero Program was merely a show of support for the states during World War II, sending laborers instead of soldiers north of the border. It's just become something much greater. Mexican Braceros, migrant workers, enjoy fair wages and honest work in Californian labor camps. Now there's talk of ending the program. This will never do. President Mateo says that I'd expand the program beyond its original stipulations and, by doing so, facilitate larger cultural and economic exchanges with the U.S. I'll take effort to send off the rough edges, sand off the rough edges of the agreement, but like the Braceros who made concerns, the president is willing to use some elbow grease. Close it out for now. So what we really want to do, what I want to do, is make sure that the Gulf is extremely productive. Uh, ooh, as well as up here, because the farms are very important. Green chili and beans. Dinner served. Silence filled the rest of the dinner that night, with each of the Alvarez's his family members telling their own story without uttering a word. Ozu ate the meal of his own, simple making with haste, not even batting an eye at any of his children before finishing, after which he probably returned to his chair the newspaper won't read itself. Out of the ordinary, Miguel spoke nothing of his day, simply picking away at his beans, his looming father had made clear by his wife, Lena's heavily pregnant state, a fact which aided him more than he ate his meal. Lena stood in stark contrast with a larger portion, a meal which she savored every bit off seeing as she was feeding too. Maria, on the other hand, sat with a blank expression on her face as she flopped the chili around with her fork, seemingly uninterested in consuming the pepper, and such an unknown swirled in her head. Rodrigo couldn't take it. Leaving his meal after a few bites, he snuck away in plain sight to the roof, the rest of the kids too scared to do anything about it, lest the unspoken be confronted. <clears throat> after a few moments, Camilla, oh, Camilla, who hadn't even touched her food yet, angrily goes after him before her father does. She catches up to her brother, her eyes drifting across the skyline of the world, the city. Father will get angry, Rodrigo. Please come back. The moonlight reflects off a tear into Camilla's sight, crawling down Rodrigo's right cheek. She leaves her outburst unfinished, placing her arm on her brother's shoulder. I miss her too, Rodrigo. I miss mom as well. Guadalupe Castro, born on this day. So right now, this group, uh, the farms here are moderately productive, which is actually pretty good too. Um, so what do we have for a GDP? Stimulation is 53.21, and it's slowly going back down. Sponsored industry, um, growth is stagnant, well, ish. GDP per capita, debt, not ideal, stimulation is okay. Um, moderately active here. Oh, but we have projects too, so. So right now, do we finish anything here? A lot has been locked. Corruption. How do we lower corruption? So not start at 500. New electricity plant. I like less stimulation decay. 
More base stimulation is good. Urban quality of life is good too. Seven million dollars, which is still not bad. Base stimulation. Uh, base stimulation. Of course, what about by doing all this? I, there's no guarantee that this is actually the right thing to do. Museum of Anthropology. Ooh. Urban quality of life, intelligence, power will increase. Urban quality of life goes up, which is not bad. Research facilities will improve, which could be good too. Takes only 250 days. Base stimulation. Oh, that's not bad. Anio per peripheral. Comparison the annual peripheral expansion is minor when faced against other developments of current. But that does not mean this project is worthless. It is important to better connect Mexico City together and improve the infrastructure of the area. I like that. Get free infrastructure. Well, not really free infrastructure. Oh, so we completed the Federal Highway, which is great. Uh, so I'm literally thinking of the Anillo. I, triple N. Healthcare will improve. That's not bad. What is this? Torre Insignia. Azteca Stadium. It's not bad. Give some political power to that as well. I like that. We're going to need that. Oh, uh, no, no. No, no. Oh, no. Tlatelocro. I am so bad at pronouncing these things. And then we got this one, the drainage system. Base stimulation goes up too, it's not bad. Um, so, <clears throat> we want this one. Let me save real quick first. Um, because I wanna see, if we improve the area first and then do that, does it speed it up? Because that's what we did with the farms earlier. So we're here. We have a project we can do here. I wanna do one of these actions. Stimulation, quality of life goes up. And in this area, economy is moderately active. Farms are decent. Population wise, it's very urban. Very, very urban. Uh, public housing. Quality of life goes up. Quality of life goes up for everybody. Worker loyalty increases. It's not bad to do, too. And we saw that this would take 420 days. Base. Urban quality of life goes down, which I don't like. Worker goes down. Base stimulation. Stimulation. Unemployment. Unemployed population. I like to reduce employed population. Two um, percent. This one gives you three percent, but costs five less political power than this one. Uh, worker loyalty. Where's that at? It's not bad. Industrialists. It's not bad either. Base stimulation can go up. Urban quality of life. Oh, but worker. Cronyism. Inflation rate. Hmm. So many decisions. Rural quality of life. Urban quality of life goes up. Which will hurt uh, the migration from rural to urban. I do like work, more worker loyalty, though. That's pretty good. So many decisions. This would help us by increasing the quality of life, but there's not that much there. 10 isn't very much. Increased worker loyalty will slightly increase, very slightly decrease. So. I want to try one of these first because this is a project and this is a, you know, stimulation project. Unless we do one of these, but we can't, so. I don't want just stimulation. 3%, 2%. It's 10, it's super cheap. I don't mind, let's do this one. Sponsor industry. But I get more loyalty. I wanna do the cheaper one. There's more stimulation, better unemployed population. So let's do that one. And then we'll see about projects. It's still the same thing, okay. I thought it would help make things go faster, but okay. Corruption, 40%, not great. All right, so anyways. Santa Rosa. As the sun ascended, a melancholic rays brush the awakening city of Leon, unveiling a morning shrouded in bitter sweetness. Amidst a growing urban tapestry of Leon, whose recent growth stood as an enigma, leaving its older inhabitants estranged, it stood a sanctuary, gifted to those scarred by war, a solemn tribute to Polish refugees ravaged by persecution and forced displacement. This estate was where the children of a nation, gripped by German oppressors, found souls far from their lost homeland. Inside the state's walls, a rustic area permeated the lives of the original migrants and their families. They tended the land, embracing the communal center gifted to take its prior. Children were frolicked and elders reflected, their thoughts wandering to the last sacrifice on the journey to Santa Rosa, the little paradise. 
Um, along, among them was Valentina, a young woman in her 20s, her formative years entwined with survivors and scant memories of Poland of her parents. As she wandered the labyrinthine corridors of the estate, faded recollections resurfaced, imbuing each, each corner with nostalgia. Every inch whispered tales of resilience of men, women, and children acquainted solely with destitution. They endured the clutches of the Nazi Empire, only to be cast like livestock into the S Siberian tundra by the Soviets. Yet life emerged resilient from adversity. They stood now beneath Leon's sun, embracing newfound opportunities, defying fates to creep. They survived the horrors inflicted upon Poland, carving a place for themselves beyond the oppressive yoke of conquerors who sowed devastation and disrepair. Or despair. And their hearts a surge in unyielding spirit and an anthem of survival, and their eyes gleamed to determination, shredding the shackles of desolation. As the sun bathed the city in gold hues, the children of Santa Rosa estate danced upon the ruins of the past, their footsteps weaving a symphony of hope. Melancholy and bitter sweetness intertwined in every stride, and owed resilience within a nation were born, their little Poland. Where there's doubt, let me bring faith. Urgent report on Dominican operations. Oh. On approximately 2015 this evening, two agents of the Dominican Military Intelligence Service, or the SIM, attempted to assassinate Tawan the Bosch as he returned to his hotel in the Federal District's uh, Zona Rosa. The DFS has been formed of a likely effort by a source within the Trujillo administration and established protective surveillance around Bosch, uh, the primary leader of the Dominican opposition, upon his arrival in Mexico. Noting a Toyota with shaded windows trailing Bosch's taxi for multiple lo blocks, a DFS agent rammed the vehicle with his own while calling for backup. Two of our men fled to the Toyota, but were pursued and dispatched by multiple agents in a firefight. The profile of one of the assassins matched a known SIM agent, but the other was unknown to DFS sources. Both possessed high-quality fabricated documents, identifying them as Banco de Comercio employees and carrying modern German armaments. Agents are currently attempting to identify SIM contacts, safe houses, or entry points used by the two men, but progress has been slowed by injuries sustained in the operation. Until such a time as those assets are seized and the lack of additional infantry is confirmed, Bosch's safety cannot be guaranteed. The Trujillo government has also responded to past defeats by targeting Mexican security and political officials. Further espionage operations by the Dominican Republic constitute an escalating threat to the national security. Respectfully, Captain Luis de la Barreda Moreno. Forward immediately to the President Lopez Mateos. Yeah, I got more words for that, but that's good at least. A communist revolution in Croatia. Oh, yes, good. From our sister cities, reform the Pacera program. Operation. Oh, God. Yo Chicalco? He got a second chance back in 58 when I gave the guy amnesty. Go ahead with the operation, President Mateos reflects for a moment, weighing the repercussions of killing Jaramillo, but puts the phone down. The old Zapatista has to be dealt with. The games have gone on for far too long. Meanwhile, in the city of Clalquitengo, Moreos, uh, a unit of federal judicial police outside Jaramillo's home springs into action, blitzing the house amidst demands of submission. Jaramillo, his wife, Epifania and her three sons resist, but are quickly overpowered, soon finding themselves with their hands tied blindfolded in the back of a van. After a long, grueling drive, the van arrives at Zochicalco ruins. Knowing his fate is sealed, Yaramilo lunges at one of the guards, getting knocked unconscious instantly as his face meets the butt of a rifle. Epifania, Epifania attempts the same, letting out an agonizing cry she is thrown to the stones. You stupid woman, get your hands off my mouth. The soon's wishes are soon cut short by gunfire, and he collapses to the ground. As he wails, the laughing officers force fistfuls of dirt into his mouth until the son whispers, whimpers his last breath. Impatient, the officers finish off the family with bullets of the skull, marking the end of Ruben Yaramilo. Miraculously, his daughter slipped through the raid, and with the word spreading of the massacre, everyone from Pan to the communists are demanding justice. While the government ignoring the police, however, Yaramilo's name has become a rallying cry of the masses, joining the ranks of Guzman and Zapata in the pantheon of the working class, his message of revolution resonating with ever more dismayed workers, but the PRIs feel the revolution. The spark of struggle reignited. Movie night in Ciudad Trujillo. Two men died the day that SIM hanged Tavito. Tavito's corpse was flung in his wife's garden. The other, his brother Antonio de la Maza, sat drunk in General Juan Tomas Diaz's garden five years later. It was movie night. Antonio's stupor was undisturbed by the blare of Mexican accents coming from the romantic comedy, nor by the chatter of the others, or regime insiders who, growing doubts, found escape in this oasis, one of the few Dominican in the Republic. Few in the Dominican Republic. These movie nights have been going for a while, volume rising as the whispers turn from gripes to treason. Trujillo had not measured the caliber of foe he made when he publicly shamed Diaz for the general's merciful treatment of Cuban prisoners of war. Another sip of rum entered Antonio's mouth, clouded his mind. The pangs of the ulcers faded. He lo the look of shame on his wife's face after he staggered home from another night of horrors faded. The disdain for his best friend El Torco, friend no more for doing nothing faded. For nothing. For doing nothing. For Antonio had done nothing when they framed Tavito as a murder and a suicide to cover up the regime's crimes. Antonio had done nothing when they brought him alone before Trujillo. Nothing when the generalissimo's high-pitched voice said he had no role in Tavito's death. Nothing when he had every chance to clasp the jefe's neck in his hands and choke. Antonio felt a hand on his shoulder and turned. It was General Diaz, whom, with his other extended, helped Antonio to his feet. Beside the blooming uh, Kiskeñana stood a man from the U.S. consulate waiting. Perhaps three men died that day. Networking.
Major, I think I might introduce my associate, rather Salinas Lozano, or Beto Watanabe, at first nodded to Salinas, then back to the Major. Licenciado, my dear friend, Major Shunichi Onodera. Salinas smiled warmly as he shook hands with the Japanese man before him. He'd been looking to expand a circle of contacts at the embassy, and it just so happened that Watanabe was willing to play the go-between. It is my pleasure to make your acquaintance. I must confess myself an ardent admirer of your great nation. I hope to be able to visit again soon. The pleasure is all mine, licenciado, replied Onodera in impeccable Mexican Spanish, meeting Salinas' gaze with a polite yet steadily analytical look. I'm told you're considered a potential presidential candidate. Tell me, how are your prospects? Hard to say, Salinas admitted. Competition is fierce, though my chances are better now than they've ever been before. I'm glad to hear it. I must say it would be most pleasant development to see such a friendly face at the head of this country. Salinas agreed with the major, of course, but he still could not shake the feeling that the man was swaying him up like a farmer eyeing up a prized cow at a market sale. Regardless, the conversation between the two flowed for nearly an hour, and by the end, Salinas felt that he and Onodera had established a proper connection. Bidding the major a fond farewell, he returned back to his black Toyota with a thin smile. Shortly before sunset, Onodera sat in his office at the embassy, freshly scribbled letter in hand, Koidi. He called to one of his uh, underlings, had this message delivered to Tokyo immediately, I've found an opportunity they're not going to want to miss. The rising sun turned his gaze on Salinas. <coughs> Hopefully we can help lower the poverty rate too, so... Uh, naval stuff. Uh, I guess we're green water navy, huh? Well, we'll do what we can. A quick win. Raised by a fading ray, the sun was leading Los Pinos, but President Lopez Mateos and Secretary Ordaz remained. The planning meeting for the upcoming tour of the U.S. had stretched on as the two paced and prodded at Ordaz's uh, copious notes. Every offering, every ask, every deal was scrutinized until the president failed to stifle young. Composing himself with a grunt, Lopez, Lopez Mateos said, One more, and let's call it a day. This, his finger traced along the paragraphs of text to a lean bullet. Sister Cities Initiative looks attractive. Voluntary partnerships between our cities and similar ones across the border. As much as I may favor this approach, our royal party members are much more likely to know of Ambassador Wilson's intrigues or the punitive expedition of President Wilson than Ordaz tapped the map on the page 60, Wilson, North Carolina. Lopez Mateos wondered how late Ordaz uh, has stayed up pouring over an atlas to craft that line, so his point regarding the measures optics reign true. Mateo sighed then, so we taper our encouragement, focus on promoting this initiative to a more receptive leadership. In some ways, smaller towns and cities would benefit the most. Ordaz replied, a sister city relationship would be the first opportunity many to have to attract attention beyond our borders. Opening up the tourist trade, visits to and from their U.S. partners could also lead to valuable exchanges on municipal infrastructure and urban planning. Lopez Mateos put his papers together and stood, with Secretary following suit, and until the twilight he announced his choice. Hmm. We'll push for partnerships, but only to see where it will go over well. Plus one to pro-American proposal. We'll take sister cities nationwide. If officials object, it's voluntary anyways. Nationwide. Partnerships. Bureaucrat loyalty to decrease. The president's opinion of leftists and nationalists. Well, I mean, it makes sense to go where it only go well. It's voluntary. I don't want to increase loyalty. They're barely loyal to us right now anyways. Oh, look at that. We get more political power gain. Civilian spending is better. Taxable population. We're going to tow the party line, maybe? I don't know. We get more opinion of the leftists and nationals. Do we want that? You know? Is this something we actually want? I do want to keep some political power in reserve, too, just in case. Extremely negative. Average. Average. Huh. The American connection, of course. What is this? U.S. proposal value. Having four proposal value four or more will ensure a strong position when negotiating for the superpowers backing for the Olympics. Whereas a proposal value of two to three will give us an adequate application. Anything below could throw our application in contention. A proposal of five or more is likely to make us over reliant on America and force Mateos to seek out more leftist independent politicians within his government. Um, I like the benefits we have right now. I don't really want to lower the loyalty. Because if we do this, it is slightly decreased. Let's, I'm going to push for more loyalty. Kind of have to, you know. What is this? Has been lost, but another will come. So right now we're, we're at value one. Yeah. So now you're what, 95? Yeah. Is that shit up all the government? Oh, hey, that's looking even better now, which is great. Economy's coming up, the deficit's better, you know. What's not to love? And economic sphere, we have Cuba with us. 
Not worth very much, but sphere percent global GDP. Not much. Do, do we have anything else here yet? Not yet. Okay. Uh huh. No projects so far. Labor, uh, unemployed citizenry, uh, raw quality of life, stimulation, subsidized mechanization, farming productivity goes up, more stimulation. Oh, here you get more political power. This is one we, we have to do. Farming productivity goes down, just a little bit, but raw quality of life goes up. Get more peasant, peasant loyalty and more political power, so I definitely want that one. Peasantry, um, there's more corruption than loyalty. I want more loyalty from them, though. So for this one, farming productivity. So we don't necessarily want to lower our productivity. Um, it's slightly unproductive. You can do this one. Peasant loyalty will increase. How much debt do we have here? Oh, it's it's quite a bit actually. Slightly unproductive. Slightly unproductive. Slightly moderate productive. 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 So we can do it in areas where there's not very productive anyways, and still improve quality of life. Because right now, for it's very rural, which is fine. Um, quality of life, we can increase this. So it's not a big deal to do it here. And it's under agronomics. So Ikatan, slightly unproductive, slightly productive. Oh, these are slightly unproductive, yeah. There you go. Not bad. Things are happening in Latin America. More stimulation, more farming productivity. Very productive. Very productive. Even more productivity, 3% more. We have more cash crops here, so I kind of want to do this one instead. Make it even more productive. And hemispheric friendships, more political power, more peasant loyalty, which is not bad. American business opinion will rise slightly. Let's do this one next. Compromise on trade duties. The giant of the north has insatiable demands for oil, beef, farm workers, and absolutely anything our nation can supply. Oh, look at this. Um, the United States is also, as an abundance of machines, technical expertise, and finance our nation so desperately needs, as it industrializes. Accordingly, we must take every step to improve relations and secure economic growth for Mexico. The best place to start will be lower tariffs and duties on our most traded goods. We'll send out feelers for the administration to begin negotiations. <coughs> so we'll probably want to increase loyalty and... At least loyalty. Power? Eh. But definitely loyalty. And then Catholic Church denounces Trujillo. In response to the ongoing nationwide crackdown on the underground June 14th resistance movement and other opposition has left over 500 dead or disappeared and thousands arrested, the five bishops and the archbishop and apostolic nuncio of the Dominican Republic Lino Zanini has signed a pastoral letter denouncing the regime's action. As the letter's condemnations of atrocities and human rights violations are read about at every Sunday Mass across the country, the Catholic Church, one of the key partners to the regime, appears to have irrevocably broken with Generalissimo Trujillo. As the underground opposition continues to grow, the foundations of the Trujillo regime, a bastion of fascism in the Caribbean, appear shaken. It won't be long now. Pray for those in greatest suffering and tribulation. So we need more industrialist power and loyalty. Just loyalty. So we need loosened labor laws. Urban quality of life goes down. Base stimulation goes up. Moderately active, slightly active, moderately active. Because here, if we were to do this, uh, how urban is it? Because the more urban it is, the quality that hurt us more with quality of life. Stimulation, is it a base? What? Goes up barely. Unemployed population does get better though. Any place that doesn't hurt the urban population too much. I want more rural. Anything else? Because here, in the southwest, it's very rural. So that'll help us out. 
have been good so far. Industrialists, I hurt them a little bit, but now they're coming back, hopefully. Brazil wins World Cup. Diligencia. Workers are okay. Peasantry's okay-ish. Yeah. And DFS. Good. Oh! And there goes a the train over it. Here's what it is. Yes, El Pollo e El Caballo. Fernando Gutierrez Barrios, DFS captain, met many would-be revolutionaries in line of work. They answered his questions and then would not be heard from again. Then how special to receive a message not from yet another communist or syndicalist agitator, but from a true revolutionary, from Fidel Castro. The two become acquainted in all suspicious circumstances. In 56, Gutierrez had trailed the Cuban and his guerrillas as they plotted Bastitas downfall from a ranch in Mexico State. The first time Castro saw his face, Fernando was slapping handcuffs on him. But in the interrogations that followed, Castro's words had not been those of a criminal, but those of a revolutionary out to topple Cuban Huerta, or those of a possible asset for Mexico. They came to an arrangement, and Gutierrez and Barrios arranged for the dissidents' release. As the rebels set sail from Tuxpam to the homeland, the duo's shaken hands. The telegram now in the same hand carried congratulations on Gutierrez's promotion, and undying tales of Castro's latest hunting and fishing, their typical friendly correspondence until a Dominican question arose. <coughs> Excuse me. Castro argued that the town was right to rid Hispaniola of its tin-pot fascist dictator. The Republic's German patrons are spread thin, and old allies like the church are growing estranged. Abs and Asim are briefly shaken by the failed assassination in Tepan Bosch. The June 14th urban guerrillas are swelling in strength, fueled by dissatisfaction among the Dominican youth and middle class. Three years of Mexican and Cuban subversion efforts now coalescing into a perfect storm. Gutierrez Barrios would alert Secretary Diaz Ordaz and the president of his temporary opportunity, along with his recommendation to take full advantage of it. He and Castro had brought down one Caribbean dictator that was one to go. And on top of the Bracero, the mood in the office of uh, President Lopez Mateos grew more tense when he and Secretary Diaz Ordaz uh, approached the topic of the Bracero program. There was an unspoken understanding between the two men that this was a particularly delicate issue. The Bracero program, which sent Mexican workers north to the U.S., was controversial on both sides of the border. Mm. We must decide what is you want to prioritize, Your Excellency, said Ordaz. As you know, the Bracero program, in its current state, is mutually beneficial. The Americans get their cheap labor, and we get a steady supply of foreign currency. Yes, yes, I understand that, Mateos began. But you must see that it brings me and my family's great pain to see how the Americans treat the men and women we send over the border. They are shameless in their exploitation of our people. <clears throat> And yet, if we try to extract greater protections for Bracero workers, we risk the farmers going for unregulated migrant labor instead. Or does explain. Perhaps think of how we may use that as a bargaining chip to extract other concessions that we seek. Coverage policy. No, you must not tell us any longer. Plus two pro-Mexican proposal. Surely we can reach some kind of a compromise. Maintain status quo. Well, we should have other options for uh, increasing the American proposal, right? I would assume so. I could be very wrong. Because um, I, I really don't want to I don't want getting more loyalty From everybody here Because who, who has loyalty? It's a, it's a bureaucracy, intelligentsia And an industrialist Loyalty would be nice Intelligentsia would be very nice to have that much loyalty And then Bureaucracy is already pretty high though So if we lose it We lose worker loyalty and industrialist loyalty we could always increase our industrial loyalty, but then there way the workers as well. Because right now, we are at what? We're going to squall, 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 and come down here. Proposal strength is one. If we get up to four, it would be good. Plus two Mexico proposal. So does that help out here? Leftist and nationalists. Then you come to the Mexican miracle. Resource efficiency gain. Use can much. Our own influence of the economy. Grants us more political power, better monthly power party change. Um. Because I do want to do this one next. Free trade with America. Bearing business will increase. Influence will increase. Industrialist power will decrease. So if we're going to lose industrialist power and loyalty. It makes more sense for us to increase this one. So we do this one. What happens? So now they're at 65, which is you know, it's a little higher, which is nice. They're at 100, which is great. And they're very loyal to us. And then if we come down here. Oh, oh, negative one. Hmm. Which means everything else would, we would have to do would be towards America. Increase, 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 increase. 
So, honestly, I might go back and do the other one, maybe. I don't mind lowering loyalty. We'll probably lower loyalty instead. That's why I saved before. But we'll end it there for today, my friends. If you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I will see you tomorrow as we are going to continue doing what Mexico can do to industrialize and make it a better place for everybody. Thanks for watching and have a great rest of your day.